think it was uh, very successful, Natalia, but probably for reasons that I don't even think at the UN uh, that organised it uh, appreciate. Um, it was my first COP. Uh, I had very few expectations other than that there would be lots of very long lines, and there were lots of very long lines. Um, but it drove home to me that the, the politics that people see at home in their nightly news is such a tiny part of of COP, it's almost and it's almost distant from what the the bulk of of the thirty nine thousand people, thirty thousand of us are probably there for what is the world's biggest trade fair in sustainable energy, and I really think the true value of COP is the thousands and thousands of small meetings of small conversations of people swapping business cards doing deals, getting to understand each country's characteristics, different business characteristics, and the cumulative impact of those thousands of little decisions are what is going to, A, move uh, renewable energy forward. Uh, it's going to help us really combat climate change, uh, but also help us to understand the needs of the, the developing countries of the global south, which to me was one of the most important outcomes from COP. You know, the people sitting at home watching the news at night have probably got a better idea of what's going on on a daily basis because they get a summarised package at the end of the day, whereas those of us on the floor are just getting snippets of what's happening. And sure, um, Alok Sharma, particularly in the second week, would do a daily brief for all uh, in the Blue Zone, and uh, that, was, that was wonderful, going in and sitting and listening to to him and to his lieutenants and to the countries. That was, a, that was for a person who's a junkie on politics and, and public relations like I am, that, that was a, a wonderful thing. But you never could quite keep on top of everything that was going on. Um, uh, so for me, the value was walking around the blue zone, visiting the different countries, sitting down, listening to, you know, the two they, they put on two or three talks a day, sitting down and listening to the, their perspective of the the renewable energy uh, revolution, um, learning about um, particularly from the from what I would loosely call the global south, the fact that yeah, sure, it's about climate change. And sure, many of those countries are the ones that are going to be impacted. But more importantly, about that, it was about their economic development and and their chance not to be energy poor. Uh, for their first time in their history, because they've got windy, so windy, sunny places um, where they can generate uh, green electrons, and that was to me that was the most exciting takeaway from COP. So, in a, in a nutshell, uh, Hero is a catalyst. It's a true catalyst that uh, takes hydrogen and oxygen in an enclosed space and helps them to do what they do best, which is to form water. But in the process of forming water, we release enormous amounts of heat very quickly without combustion. It's a true catalyst that doesn't get used up in the process, so there's no greenhouse gases. The, the issue that we see from the perspective of hydrogen is that so much effort in the public sector particularly, but also the private sector are being put into the supply side issues around hydrogen, how to generate it, how to generate it at a reasonable price, how to store it, um, how to transport it. And while all that is fine, what we really need to do is to concentrate on the demand side case for hydrogen. And when I say hydrogen, I mean green hydrogen, because that's what our customers and our investors are demanding. It's basic economics. If you create a demand for something, then investors, inventors, and entrepreneurs will come in on the supply side and solve whatever issues are seen. So we, we, we think more needs to be done on the demand side. And suddenly with Hero, with our catalyst, you have the demand side activator. This is, this is a missing piece in the puzzle, which is how do you take that energy source, that battery, which is green hydrogen, liberate the heat from it, without combustion and all of a sudden at, at, at volumes that is that is acceptable 
uh, and required by industry. Sure, there are fuel cells for, for motor vehicles and for some smaller applications. But when you are in talking industrial heat and potentially industrial heat turned to energy for industrial size energy, there, there has been nothing uh, come along until, until HERO. Um, and that's the exciting thing. And the thing that we've learned in our journey over the last uh, 18 months is we, we, we were particularly focused on energy, but how, how much low hanging fruit there is in the processed heat market. And it's been, it's been the food industry and the beverage industry globally that have come to us and said, look, we've electrified everything that we can, but we still need lots of fossil fuel to provide steam, to provide hot water, to, to dry milk. And we're not going to replace that with electricity. We, we need something new. We've tried biogas. We've tried biomass. Uh, we've tried other things. Um, can Hero help? And the answer is yes. So for the first time, we've got this massive demand side activator. For the use of hydrogen, the catalyst is agnostic as to the type of hydrogen it uses. But as I said earlier, our investors and our, our potential customers are demanding one colour, and that's green. The, the really exciting thing about the Philippines is, is it's the first country that we have uh, signed an MOU with. Um, and the exciting thing about the Philippines and a lot of the rest of the developing world in, in again, in the global south, is that they are, they're almost greenfield uh, opportunities for, for technology like ours. When you're talking the Northern Hemisphere, whether it's the, the, the United States, um, Canada, or Europe, there are lots of legacy players there and lots of legacy infrastructures that are trying to uh, retrofit uh, renewable energy. They're trying not to have stranded assets. They're very embedded in the, the governments and the public policy. Uh, whereas uh, the global the global South and, and, and nations like the Philippines, they're just starting out. It's And, and that's what's so exciting. They're, they're saying for the first time, oh, we've got a lot of wind offshore that we can generate, with which we can generate our own energy and store it in the form of hydrogen. And so they've, they've reached out to us and we've reached out to them and the MAU is the, is the journey from uh, and it, relatively energy poverty or being a, a net energy importer to being a, a net energy producer and using it domestically. And, and the first stages of that will be mapping out their infrastructure needs in the, in the supply chain. But the same applies for uh, India. Um, I spent a lot of time at COP talking to African nations and, and learning about their requirements. Um, you know, the, 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 it, across the globe, there, there are about a billion people who have no access to electricity. And for reasons of politics and geography and sometimes combined, they're not going to have any time soon the access to a, a Western style electricity grid as we know it. So for their economic development, they need alternative sources and, and microgrids, alternative sources of energy, alternative sources of heat. And the, and the great thing about that I've found at COP is they're up for it. They, they're seeking us out saying, okay, can you help? We, we, we need to grow. We need to grow economically. We need, we need um, energy justice. We need climate justice. And we know we're not gonna, it's gonna take too long for us to catch up uh, using grids. The Philippines is a good example. You know, it's 7,000 populated islands, a lot of them running on diesel generators. And they know they need to change and they know they need a better form of energy. And, and to me, that's, that's the exciting takeout that I took from, from COP. It, it reinforced what the Philippine government is trying to do, Filipino government. And, um, and, you know, it added a bit of an extra pep to our step. No need to delay the rollout of hydrogen. You, you hear a lot about, oh, it's going to take a while. It's going to take 10 years. It's going to take 20 years. 
Um, we don't believe that. Star Scientific doesn't believe believe that. So hopefully we can get across, you know, a, a bit of a a bit of a um, you know motivational type uh, uh, approach to to get us going and talking to each other. The the, the one area that that um, we see that where governments really do need to invest um, is in a global, transparent regulatory system around hydrogen, its use and its handling. Now that gets a bit boring. I know, you know no politician has ever got re-elected for saying that they want to bring in uh, new regulations, but in our area, because it's so new, um, we need it. Uh, the trading mechanisms, all those sorts of things, the more that we can we can talk amongst ourselves and get these things uniform, the faster the hydrogen revolution is going to happen.